I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. Oh, and then that creates trouble for myself here. Um, sorry. Uh, participants and chat. All right. Sorry, I just need to get the chat and the participants here so that we can see them. All right. Again, um, welcome. What I'd like to do tonight is just take a, a few minutes on each of seven documents I've sent out. There are, uh, I, I mean, I teach on the Reformation at university every couple of years or so, have for many years, and there are hundreds and hundreds of documents. I mean, it's because of the role of the printing press in the time of the Reformation, we have um, a, a really astounding array of, um, uh, of documentation uh, on, um, on the Reformation itself. And uh, welcome, Kevin. And, uh, and so we have all these documents, and it's very difficult to choose between them, but these are some of the sort of essentials that um, I and others uh, tend to focus on um, as an entry point into the Reformation. And so uh, it seems uh, that the obvious place to start would be at the 95 Theses. And what I want to do with all of these documents is just really spend literally you know, five to eight minutes on them. This is not meant to be the most sort of in-depth treatment of these documents ever. It's meant to be just an introduction to some of the important sources, and it'll help us get at a few of the key ideas that we've already been talking about on Monday and on Wednesday. So hopefully it helps just reinforce some of that stuff. And the first of these is the 95 Theses. And I I've been hinting at this that um, this is not the easiest document to uh, navigate. It is not really 95 separate statements. It's really a collection of points, many of which build on one another. And frankly, it reminds us uh, that Luther was, from the outset, a theologian and a biblical scholar, and he was um, concerned about the problem of indulgences uh, from a theological perspective, or as a theological professor. Um, the, the way the film shows it, and certainly indeed in real life, he cares very much pastorally about people and about the potential deception of people, but um, there's a lot in here that is very sort of uh, detailed theological argument and late medieval theology at that. So we're not going to get into all of that. We're just going to talk about some of the main points. And I, I highlighted some of the main ideas. There are other points that could have been highlighted. Um, but uh, I just want to get at sort of the bigger, big ideas. So feel free to use the chat to raise questions or unmute yourself and just interrupt and speak out a question. That's fine too. We don't have Tim and Colin here tonight. They each had something else up and thought the other would be here. So we're flying solo and, um, and we'll manage just fine. So the invitation is interrupt via chat or um, audio anytime um, you like if you have questions or comments. So clearly the beginning of this document, we see some of the points that are often sort of referenced when we talk about the 95 Theses, and that is to do with uh, repentance, right? First and foremost, the 95 Theses is a call to put repentance uh, at the center of Christian devotion and not to sidestep the issue of repentance for sin, 
uh, through the mechanism of indulgences and especially the rather crass um, swapping of indulgences for donation virtually buying and selling uh, that was uh, common in Luther's day and particularly uh, around 1517 when John Tetzel began preaching ie selling the indulgence around St. Peter's in the area not too far from where Luther lived about 24 miles away in Jutterbog. So it's about repentance um, and uh, not uh, taking false uh, confidence in buying or selling indulgences. Another issue that comes up is the role of the Pope and the authority of the Pope um, over purgatory and over the idea of penalties. And again, this gets a bit complicated theologically, but the idea of an indulgence is a release from the penalty related to sin. One could be, one could confess and be forgiven, but there was still a penalty to do with sin, and the indulgence was supposed to release one from the penalty, either here on earth, penance, or in the afterlife in purgatory on the way to heaven. And Luther makes the point that the Pope actually doesn't have any say on what happens after death. What, go, what goes on in purgatory is, you know, we're not quite sure, Luther says, but what we do know is that the Pope doesn't control it. So it's a limitation on papal authority. And, and so then these themes then start weaving uh, out from there about the need for repentance, the danger of false certainty, the limits on papal control over, over indulgences, over penalties in purgatory. Um, once we get sort of to the... Um, middle part of it around sort of 35 and 30, 35 to 40. Oh, should say these ones in the late 20s. You heard on the movie uh, and you've maybe read or heard elsewhere this famous line, you know, when the coin in the coffer rings, so the soul from purgatory springs. That is actually a line that was used by indulgence preachers and Luther references it here. And, um, and says, no, this is uh, just about greed, not, uh, not actual forgiveness. When we get into sort of 35 to 40, um, we're into, again, the need for repentance. And Luther says, if you repent, you actually don't need uh, an indulgence at all. He moves into the idea of works of mercy. It's better to give your money to the poor, better to help other people than to spend your money on indulgences. He gives the Pope a bit of a pass at this point and says, well, surely, you know, if the Pope knew, he would never uh, approve of all of this. And so this is part and parcel of Luther's claim that he's not actually attacking um, you know, the authority of the Pope. Now, his uh, uh, enemies, when, when the enemies he made by publishing this, when he sent this to the Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz, who then sent it on to Rome, realizing the danger to um, the sale of indulgences, to the money that he needed to earn, and he could see that this was at least potentially could be interpreted as an attack against papal power, papal authority. And indeed, uh, some of the early written rebuttals to um, the 95 Theses actually call it, you know, the 95 Theses and, you know, Luther's attack on papal authority. So, so his opponents uh, in Rome very quickly um, decided that they weren't going to uh, uh, try to refute Luther based on the individual arguments of abuses and things like that and the specifics of indulgences, that they were actually going to make the issue, uh, the idea that Luther was attacking papal authority. And it is a bit of a, it's a bit of a fine line. Uh, in some respects, he was maybe uh, being a bit disingenuous when he said he wasn't actually attacking papal authority. Certainly the implications of the 95 Theses uh, as an attack on the whole practice of indulgences, in the end, amount to an attack against something that the Pope was uh, uh, sponsoring. Uh, 
and uh, and uh, approving of. Um, other other theses mention you know preaching the gospel rather than indulgences. Uh, some of them attack in the 50s and 60s attack the idea of the treasury of merit, that theological idea that 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 led to the idea that indulgences could be issued uh, out of this treasury of merit, almost like a bank. Uh, making expenditures from a bank. Greed and scandal come up. And I think the interesting ones actually are in the 80s when Luther, at this point, says, look, these indulgences actually um, are causing scandal and common people are asking uncomfortable questions like, why doesn't the Pope build St. Peter's himself? Why does he need our money? Why doesn't he just empty purgatory if he has control over purgatory? Why make people pay for it? And things like that. So whether those are Luther's criticisms or really those of the lay people, he, he puts them in those terms and sort of this is all part and parcel of his criticism. And then he ends the 95 Theses with this you know injunction to Christians to you know follow Christ even if it means sort of suffering and hardship, you know follow uh, Christ uh, and that's the answer. So that's a brief, brief summary. Any questions uh, about the 95 Theses or comments about what you saw in there? Again, it, it, it can be quite tricky. They're, they're quite dense at times as well. So I'll just stop for a moment. You can unmute yourself and ask or use chat if you like. If you have questions or comments, pardon me, about the 95 Theses. Comment from Rolf. Reformation process continues even today. Besides the obvious, in purgatory, what age of reforms have been forced to make reconciled doctrine. Scripture is given 500 years of religious education, plural, well funded, well educated priests. Oh, that's a big question, Rolf. Um, at the Council of Trent in the 1540s to 50s, um, the Catholic Church recognized um, the authority of Scripture to a degree alongside the authority of, um, of the Church, of tradition and, and uh, the Church uh, institutionally. But it very much uh, doubled down, we might say. It very much reaffirmed the importance of the sacraments as the means of grace. And it reaffirmed the idea of justification by faith and uh, works and, and a combination of, of uh, human participation in that and, and through the sacraments. And so in that sense, the battle lines were drawn or the, 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 the dividing line was drawn. And that sacramental theology has remained uh, at the centerpiece of Catholicism, along with papal authority and so forth. So some of those uh, foundations of, of authority and sacramental theology within the Catholic Church have been very much unchanged. The irony is that both Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox Christians as well, since the 1500s up until the present, have all experienced the many challenges of the modern world in much the same way. The challenge of rationalism, the challenge of the secular state, uh, uh, challenges around um, uh, expansion of of the of the gospel uh, globally. Um, so, so many of the actual experiences of the churches of all kinds have been similar in the modern age. But but in terms of some of the basic um, sacramental. Uh, uh, theological points and papal authority, that's remained uh, fairly constant. Yeah, at this point he is still speaking uh, uh, as a, a, a Catholic um, theologian. The point though I think is again to say that his opponents very quickly seized upon this as an attack against papal authority. And it was on that basis that they wanted to shut him down. If you think of the visit 
of Cardinal Cayetan to Augsburg in 1518 that was captured in the film. The idea is that the Pope decides what is true and Luther should submit to that. And so the issue of papal authority is already by 1518 front and center in this. Let's jump on to the tower experience, the so-called tower experience. Could always come back with other questions at the end, um, but I want to do. I do want to sort of get through these all at least in a short way, um, within our hour here, roughly. So the tower experience is dated as 1519. This is what Luther himself says. Um, this is his. Um, writing from 1545 it's a year before he dies he's uh you know already uh, struggling with his health he's you know his life is winding down um and he's reflecting back on sort of the story of his conversion you might say and he points to 1519 as a point at which he has this experience that's probably not actually when it happened um there's been a lot of debate about this timing, and it really um, can stretch anywhere from the early uh, 15 teens, say 1514, 15, somewhere in there, all the way maybe to 1520 or so. But the best um, evidence actually is that it's probably from somewhere around 1515 because it was at that time that Luther was preparing for lectures that he was going to give, a course he was going to give on Romans. And at the same time, he was writing commentaries. So his writing of commentaries and preparing of lectures, it's kind of all wrapped up in the same academic work. And it reminds us that Luther's Reformation comes out of his own partly out of his own personal experiences, his own personal struggles, we see that in this document, but also very much out of his own slow and steady theological work and biblical study. And so probably actually 1515 is a better dating because it's right then that he's starting into Romans and he does make some of the same sorts of points in his Romans commentary and, and lecture notes and so on. But at any rate, no matter what the date, it seems like Luther is capturing here his experience um, of sort of, do we say he wasn't saved before this? I'm not saying that, but, but a kind of a, a sort of an experience of um, uh, God's love and mercy and grace, a kind of a salvation type experience. And he describes here his, his frustrations as a monk, uh, trying to please God, but just so not being able to do that. And, um, and he feels that God is just this judging, harsh God. And, and the film captures that. We saw that and talked about that the other day. Uh, and, uh, and here he's got this kind of breakthrough that happens, right? He meditates, he studies, he's thinking about this over and over. He's consumed by this problem of his sin. And um, then he's got this realization that justice is not, doesn't actually unfold the way he thinks. It's not this judging God, but rather it's the gift of being just, of being righteous that God gives. And as he says, that by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. And he goes to Romans, the just person lives by faith. And he says, I felt like I'd been born again. I felt like I'd go, come into paradise. Um, and what's interesting is this then drives a whole re-examination of scripture for him. Suddenly, other things start popping into his mind. How, in fact, the work of God is not some kind of 
striving. It's no, it's the work God does in us, the power of God, the way that God gives us power, the wisdom of God, the gift of wisdom that he gives us, and so on and so forth. So that's a little bit about that tower experience. And he is clearly enraptured uh, by it. The last thing I would say about it is that he invokes Augustine. And this is not just a, a sort of coincidence. He's a member of the Augustinian order. So Augustine is an important writer and theologian to him. But I think there are two other elements to it. First of all, without again going into much detail here, in the scholarly theological realm in which Luther was working, he was, uh, he and others around him were applying new sort of um, rhetorical approaches to scripture and moving away from much of the medieval scholastic theology. And Augustine was an important resource in this. And I think the other thing that's important to realize is that Luther and the other reformers did not think uh, and did not want it to be seen that they were doing something new. To be innovative was a terrible thing uh, in, in their minds and in the minds of people in their world. And so really what they're trying to do is to show that, yeah, people in the early church understood things the way we do. We're, we're in sync with them. And it's, it's, the, and it's the medieval era in between that's gotten off track. So any comments or questions about the tower experience? Any questions about that? Either by chat or just unmute yourself and feel free to ask away. It is a good read. I, I, I think it's one of the documents, I think, that, that really brings Luther alive uh, to me. Um, it, it makes him seem um, like a real person going through a real spiritual experience. And, uh, and yeah, I agree. It, 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 we do sort of hear, um, it gives us a window into that personal struggle and that in that, that, sort of personal spiritual crisis that's also such an important driver uh, of the Reformation um, through Luther, in and through Luther. Well, let's jump over to the address to the Christian nobility of the German nation concerning the reform of the Christian estate in 1520. So I've tried to arrange these more or less chronologically that we're moving through things. We can sort of see the process of the Reformation. Rolf, what do you what are you amazed by what he doesn't say? What do you are you talking about the last document or this one now? There, I've unmuted myself. Um, I'm talking about uh, just this last one. Yeah. And, and, and my question was, you know, when when we look at um, Lutherism and the Roman Catholic Church itself, um, Luther doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about um, the Virgin Mary and, and uh, talking about uh, her as an intercessor for everybody and the, and the, uh, the, the litany of priests that uh, have, have gone before him that, that are to be, uh, um, what's the word that they use? They give... Um, well, they're aid. They give aid. They're they're the idea that they're kind of are helping helping people along uh, to Christ. Yeah, it, it, it's it's the whole business of kissing the icon and yeah. uh, there's so, a word for it. I forget what that word is. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm maybe it'll, if it comes to you, let me know. Yeah. Um, but here, here's what I would say about that. What the reason these kinds of um, practices and with them a, a certain theology developed within Catholicism is because in the medieval era the um, the notion of the, the, the sort of the kingship of God and the exalted majesty of God was so uh, important and so prominent 
that and and, and the in the view of humans as so um uh debased and i mean luther calls himself a worm uh, like so um sinful that even the idea of approaching christ was far far too daunting and so this is where the idea was that the various saints or the virgin mary herself mm -hmm. Christ's mother, I mean, how better to get at Christ than through his mother? And so that these would be helpers to get to Christ uh, because God was just so unapproachable. And what the Reformers do, what the Reformation does, is it um, draws Christ back down into a realm closer to um, that of people. And... Um, We'll see this on Monday as well when I talk about the Reformation in Basel. That idea of being fed up with mediation, with having to go through go-betweens to get to God, is a big part of the Reformation. And so um, for Luther and for other Reformers, the, the atonement through Christ and the, and the access to God, the direct access to God through Christ is so important. So important. And yet, why to him is this a new subject? Like throughout the, the scriptures, um, it, it's time and time again, you know, the, the curtain was shredded. Uh, yep. we, we have access. And did, did that concept of direct access to God get lost from like 481 AD till 1500 yeah. AD? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. The, I mean, this, I mean, look, after a thousand years, uh, you know, one of the things I would say is you're talking about a thousand years of practice building up. So, you know, if you think about how quickly institutions kind of either get hardened or get kind of caught up in side issues or whatever, and you think of a thousand years of practice. So, Part of it is lack of access to the Bible, lack of literacy, uh, the growth of the institutional church as, as a sort of bulwark in a very uh, tumultuous and insecure medieval era, and, and the role of the priests, the role of the hierarchy just becomes so important. So, so much of that gets lost. It, that's why it seems to us like, in a sense, sort of Christianity 101 stuff, but uh, it, much of that had been lost on, in terms of the regular practice of the church. And so the reformers do a great deal to bring that back for us. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump on now and talk uh, about, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Not studying scripture, studying other things. Let's look at the address to the Christian nobility. So um, this is, uh, I think, quite a st st simple, straightforward document. Um, and actually, the first few lines uh, provide the summary that the rest of the first section, and I've only given you part of the first section here, there are other sections in this document, but uh, the first few lines give us kind of the shape of the document, and um, uh, then we can see sort of where it's going. And so what Luther is arguing here in the address uh, to the Christian nobility is that um, the Romanists, his opponents, have uh, built uh, three walls around themselves to, to, to hide behind, in a sense, to try to protect themselves from what he would say would be legitimate criticism of their practices and, behind that, their theology. And part of the reason I like to use this also is because of sort of the language uh, we get a, uh, uh, in these primary sources, we can often get a, a, a sort of a, a feel for the writers. Uh, and with Luther, uh, um, that means um, often some very vigorous language. So he says, um, uh, the Romanists have built three walls. They're going to defend them. Uh, no one can reform them. It's a terrible corruption. And he says, first of all, the first wall, he says, when pressed by the temporal uh, power. So if um, lay people, 
including, say, princes, political leaders, and so on, if they were to challenge the church leaders, uh, the clergy, um, the church would just say, that, especially the papacy, would say that um, it is the spiritual estate, the spiritual caste, if you want, and that spiritual estate is higher than the temporal. In the medieval world, they talked about two swords, a spiritual sword and a temporal sword, temporal meaning earthly or uh, in, in, in sort of by definition political. And uh, there, were, there was a great deal of ink spilled in the Middle Ages arguing for papal supremacy. Uh, Boniface VIII, in a famous papal bull in the early 1300s, makes this case that everyone has to submit to the pontiff for their salvation. And so this argument is that the papacy is the and the church is the spiritual estate, and they are higher than the temporal estate, and they cannot be, um, they're not subject to it, they cannot be critiqued by it. So second, then, Luther says, second wall is that if uh, critics come at the church and say, look, 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 the scripture says this, you're doing something wrong. They will just simply say, only the Pope uh, interprets scripture. And in the movie, if you remember, if you've seen the, the, the Luther movie, and I mentioned this the other day, at the meeting with Cayetan, in the film, Aleander, he wasn't there in real life, but in the film, Aleander, sort of in prepping Luther, makes this comment, and I think it's drawn sort of from the language of these uh, kinds of documents, this idea that um, only the Pope is the one who can interpret Scripture. Scripture. And so that's the second wall. And then the third wall, Luther says, is if critics come at the church, and particularly the papacy, and say, uh, hey, there's problems, the, the, the papacy needs to be reformed, it's too worldly, or it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not governing the church well, um, the answer is only the pope can call a church council. So again, back to papal authority, right? Uh, papal authority in the first wall over the secular powers, papal authority over the scriptures in the second wall, papal authority over church councils, that's the third wall. So this address to the Christian nobility of the German nation is all about um, uh, papal authority. And you can see that now we're in 1520, and whether or not Luther really meant to be challenging papal authority in the 95 Theses back in 1517, certainly by 1518, he was starting to hold up scripture over and above uh, papal authority. And uh, this we see again in his encounter with Cayetan. And now by 1520, he's developed here in the address to the Christian nobility of the German nation, he's developed a full-fledged theological critique of papal authority. And he says, by building these walls, they have slyly stolen uh, from us our three rods that they may, be, may go unpunished, that we can't beat them <laughs> with our three rods. So, again, uh, a little bit of the language of Luther. I think the most important of these walls uh, is, um, uh, he wants to blow down these walls with trumpets, is the first wall. Because he had already talked about the, uh, you know, even before 1520, Luther had uh, been arguing scripture was over um, uh, papal authority, and even that councils could err. In 1519, in his debate with uh, Johann Eck in Leipzig, um, Luther argued that both popes and councils could uh, err. I mentioned that on Monday. But here we've got something different in this attack against the first wall. Um, and, whoops, sorry. And, um, and he says outright, right off the hop, 
It is an invention that popes, bishops, priests, and monks are a spiritual estate, a spiritual caste, um, and that everyone else, princes, lords, artisans, farmers, are a, the temporal estate, the earthly estate, a lower, a lower status, a lower status of Christian. He says, don't be frightened by that. Um, actually, all Christians are of the spiritual estate. There's no difference. And he invokes uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians, one body, many members. So in other words, there's no difference fundamentally between the Pope and a farmer in the kind of Christian they are. They have the same status before God. They're saved in the same way. The difference would be that the priest or the bishop or the Pope has a function that he plays, it performs, but that function is a service, it's a role, it's not a higher status. And this is so important, and I think it's it's interesting. I often comment about this when I'm teaching church history. I, I, I do a little soapboxing, and I say, you know, those of us uh, who come out of Protestant churches, evangelical or other Protestant traditions, we, you know, we're, you know, all excited to be Protestants, but often the way that we think about clergy is dangerously close to the kind of thing that Luther was attacking here, that we sort of elevate clergy into a kind of a different status of Christian. And of course, the scriptures talk about, you know, having special respect and and caring for um, the pastors or the ministers among you, shepherds among you, but um, but often that spills over into I think a kind of sort of pre-reformation veneration of clergy. So you can think about that a little bit and chew on that. And so Luther even uh, sort of gives this analogy. He says, you know, if we had if we had uh, why can't I highlight this paragraph? If we had a group. Um, uh, of people and they're in the wilderness together and there's no priest there um, they can pick one they can pick one of their members to to be the one who baptizes and says the mass and so on and that would be just fine because everyone is of the spiritual estate so that's how he demolishes that first wall and after that everything else topples because um, because if there's no distinction between clergy and uh, uh, laity, if there's if everyone is is spiritual, then in fact the idea that only the Pope can interpret the Scripture uh, doesn't uh, make sense anymore, and then the idea that only the Pope can have uh, authority to call a church council, that doesn't make sense either, because it's it, it really should be, Luther says, all about what's needed. And if the if the princes need to come along and help reform the church, they sure should do so. So this is this um, uh, this uh, three walls that Luther's trying to destroy here in the address to the Christian nobility of the German nation. Now the document goes on. There are other parts of it that attack the wealth of the clergy and that call for the German church to be more separate from Rome and that also call for some reforms, call into question clerical celibacy, call into question masses for the dead, too many holy days, the veneration of relics, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are other issues in here too, but the big thing is this initial part of the document where Luther advocates, sort of lays out this doctrine we know as the priesthood of all believers, which is foundational, absolutely foundational to the Reformation. All right, questions, comments about that? Yeah, yeah, systemic injustice, corruption, yeah, good point. Good point. It is it is a systemic thing that he's after here. Not just a it's not just about a pope who misuses his position, or a bad bishop, or uh, you know a, a, an abusive priest. It's about the whole system 
uh, and how it works. All right, I'm trusting you to jump in where you want to, either via chat or via unmuting yourself, those of you who've joined partway through here. Also in the chat, if you scroll up in the chat, I've given a link to the document. If you don't have the document, if you didn't get it or can't find it, you can, whoops, you can download it. All right. Um, the confrontation at Worms. Uh, if you watch the Luther movie, uh, they use this uh, uh, almost word for word. Um, and uh, so I'm getting some feedback. Is that me or is that some? It may be if you've got your mic open uh, and the volume too loud on your computer that can it can do that kind of thing. Um, the Diet of Worms. So uh, this was used almost word for word. It's a well, it's a fairly well known document, I think, and it's fairly straightforward. Um, uh, as we know, Luther was brought before the Imperial Diet, the Parliament. They had a special session, almost like a court. And uh, Luther was his books were laid out in front of him. They were named. And then he was asked, look, are these your works? And do you um, recognize them? Do you want to take anything back maybe? And he then goes into the explanation about how he has different kinds of works. Some are faith and morals. Some are anti-papal writings. Others are disputes with private individuals and so on. You know, sometimes I got a little overheated, he says. Um, but these are my works and um, you know i can't just outright um, uh, abandon them all um, and if you'll show me from the prophets or the gospels in other words from scripture then i will throw i'll be the first one is the th one to throw my writings in the fire if you can show me from the scripture uh, where i'm wrong and it's here that he is so clearly, and this is why it's quite a useful document uh, to talk about the Reformation, and of course it's a very important point in Luther's Reformation. Uh, it's, it's certainly, I mean, there are various points at which you can say he's breaking from Rome, but for sure he is here. He's been excommunicated already, and here after this, uh, this imperial diet, he is condemned and outlawed as well. So this is a real break point. And he elevates, again, Scripture as the authority. And it's very much like he and his, and his I call him Catholic opponents, he's still Catholic technically, but they're speaking past each other. So Luther is standing on the authority of Scripture. They are standing on the authority of the Church, of the papacy in particular. And so then their response is to say uh look you're equivocating give us a yes or no and so then he makes this short sort of speech and he says here it is unless you convince me by scripture um and not by popes not by councils those can both make error they, those can both err they're faulty um unless you convince me by scripture I, I, I'm not going to budge. And he also appeals to his conscience, which is interesting as well. Um, that is, I think, somewhat uh, revolutionary in its own way, appealing to one's own conscience uh, as the guide. But it is for him not just kind of, oh, this is how I feel. He says, my conscience is bound to Scripture. So again, it's just another way of coming back to that, that idea of the authority of Scripture. Questions, comments? Again, I think the, the documents are, are helpful. Sometimes they're, 
um, you know, the language is a little hard to follow or something like that. But insofar as we can understand them, um, I think it's helpful because it gives us so much uh, more clearly a sense of the tone of the argument, a, a sense of the, the feel of the person, um, and, and that sort of thing, right? That in terms, yeah, he would, sure, he would be, I mean, they normally held their theological disputations in Latin, so certainly it would be the Latin scriptures that he's talking about. He hasn't uh, completed his translations yet. Oh, by the way, for those of you who were uh, re can remember from Wednesday and that, that meet in the film, the meeting between Luther and Frederick, uh, I was trying and trying and trying to find if Luther dedicated his Bible to Frederick, and I couldn't. And then today I stumbled across it in some reading I was doing, and he actually dedicated, a, uh, he translated a portion of the Psalms and dedicated that to Frederick, and I think as early as 1519 or 21. So much, you know, quite early in the, in, along the way. And he dedicated other writings to Frederick too. All right, Argila von Grumbach. This is probably my favorite document in Reformation history and one of my favorites in actually uh, sort of modern world history. I use it uh, every year when I teach either churches, uh, either Reformation history or world history. It's such a fascinating document to me. And so I'll ask the question to you. Uh, um, if you if you look at it, if you start reading it, what jumps out at you? What jumps out at you? Either unmute yourself and say, or just type it in the chat. She's female. She's female. Well, that's a huge issue here, that she as a woman felt like she could speak. And that's a very important part of it. Good. But about the document itself about the document itself, relies on scripture. Yeah, I mean, I think, Lisa, that's kind of an understatement. Um, I always I always sort of liken it to, I mean, this is maybe, maybe you don't like this analogy, but it's, she's almost like just machine gunning them with scripture. If you look here, there's like four pages, and I think there's, this is actually not even the full letter. It's been excerpted a little bit. I think in the full letter, there's over 80 different, references to scripture. I think there's over 60 in this in this excerpted part. And yeah, how confident is she is. And she's not just like, she's not just in Matthew and in, in Acts and in Rome. She's in the minor prophets and the major prophets. And she is ranging to and fro throughout scripture. And, and she's just pulling texts from here and there and everywhere. And uh, yeah, I'll come to that in a second, Lisa, her status as a woman. And so this is what uh, stands out so much to me uh, from this, uh, this, this letter. When she writes in the paragraph that begins, how in God's name can you and your university, she's attacking them for using violence, for using force in a spiritual matter. She says, you are coercing him, this Arsacius Seehofer, whom they forced out of the university for his Lutheranism. You are forcing him. You're using violence. How can, that, how can you do that? And she contrasts that with the word of God. She says, yet when I reflect on this, my, my heart, my limbs tremble. What do Luther and Melanchthon teach you but the word of God? You're condemning them but you haven't proven them wrong. And then she gets into this issue of being a woman. And um, uh, she goes along for a while and, and lambastes them for a good long time. And then she says, well, but I suppressed my inclinations. I was, you know, my heart was heavy, but I didn't do anything because, you know, I'm a woman, supposed to keep silent. And then she says, well, I can't see any man who's up to it, so I'm stepping in. And she 
it's interesting how she uses scripture. Scripture says so many different things. And so she recognizes that in some senses there are these scriptures that are used to keep women silent. But then she also says, whoever, whoever. And so she uses this other scripture to say, hey, no, actually, I can speak. And here it is. And let me give you some more. And so she lambastes them some more. And, and, um, and, and just scripture after scripture after scripture. Um, and then we get to this part, if God had not ordained it, um, this paragraph. Um, this I find quite interesting too, because she says, you know, even if, even if Luther were to recant, if he were to abandon his views, that wouldn't stop me. So she's, she's saying, this isn't just about Luther. There's something bigger here. And she's turned on to the word of God and this idea of the authority of scripture. And she's not letting go of that. That's what she's standing on. And then, of course, there's this wonderful last paragraph where she says, look, I, I don't know Latin, but you know German. Uh, and I can write you in German. And this isn't woman's chit chat. This is the word of God. And I write. And she's, you can feel her confidence coming through here, can't you? That she's, I write as a member of the Christian church. And again, think about the priesthood of all believers idea. She's not a clergy. She's not a person in the clergy. That's okay. She's a woman. That's okay. Because she's standing on the word. And she is a member of the church just like anybody else. And so she uh, really comes after them <laughs> in a pretty big way. It's, uh, I think it's a tremendously fun document to read as well because she really gives them, um, yeah, she does know her Bible and she really gives them uh, a, a lot of it uh, in this letter. And her husband actually was a Catholic. He, did, he was not interested in Lutheranism, but um, she was, and she seems to have had the freedom to do that. And obviously she's in a privileged position as a noble woman. She had access to education and she had access to German Bible. But I find this so interesting. This is 1523, one year after Luther is publishing his New Testament. Now there are other German Bibles. She alludes to that as well. But this, it shows you how quickly and how powerfully the idea of uh, the power of Scripture uh, comes into the Reformation. I think it's just a tremendous document for showing us that. Okay, two more to go, quickly. Twelve Articles of the Upper Swabian Peasants. Here I just want to point out uh, something quite simple. And that is, this comes during the peasant, Peasants' War, um, that violent eruption in 1524 and 25, which, uh, in which peasants revolt all over southern and central Germany. And these upper Swabian peasants from the southwest corner of Germany, uh, they gather together in an assembly. They send representatives, and uh, there's a priest who helps them. And they put forward a series of demands. And they're doing this explicitly as Christians. You know, their society is Christians. That's probably the way they would formulate it anyway. But they begin by talking about peace and order and that sort of thing. And about the gospel, the message of Christ. They're very much, you know, this is very Lutheran kind of language coming out here. And they want the gospel taught. They, 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 want, they want this to live out this new kind of Reformation Christianity. And then they raise 12 articles, 12 demands. And it's an interesting mix of spiritual and economic, social, legal, political, kind of those realms. The first two seem at first quite spiritual. We want to pick our own pastors and we want to keep the tithe money that we give local so that we can use it to help people around us. Fair enough. 
these seem like uh, uh, the kinds of reform demands that Luther would have approved of. After all, um, Luther wanted uh, uh, priests or, or ministers to teach from the Bible, and, and uh, Luther also talked about reform of, of tithes and so on. So this is all you know, seemingly within the realm of church and uh, religion. But then from the third article on, we see a whole different kind of set of demands. In the third article, they say, we object to, be, to being the property of our masters. We're serfs, we're tied to the land, and that's not fair. Number four, they object to restrictions against their, their um, uh, right to hunt. In number five, restrictions against their right to go into the common wood to cut wood that they need for fuel and heat and so on. The sixth and seventh revolve around feudal dues, services that they have to provide to their masters and the oppression of their masters over them. Number eight is about high rents that they have to pay. Number nine is about new laws that are being invented and used against them. Number 10 is about access to common fields to graze their cattle. And number 11 is about a death due that seems so unfair to them that a widow should have to pay this death due. And then number 12, at the very end, we circle back and this is going to sound very familiar now after just looking at Luther at the Diet of Worms. In the twelfth place, if any of these don't line up with the Word of God, we'll abandon them. But we think that they correspond to the Word of God. And that shows you what's going on here. They're taking Luther's ideas. And if you look through this document, you'll see a couple of words, brotherly, that comes up a few times, and free. And they're taking Luther's ideas of spiritual freedom in Christ and of equality of the priesthood of all believers, the idea of brotherhood and equality in Christ, all one body and that sort of thing. And they're saying, well, if if, if my master is my brother in Christ, why is he oppressing me? Um, how can I be his property if I'm his brother in Christ? Um, this doesn't seem fair. It's not brotherly, they say. And so <clears throat> you can see that they understand, like people have throughout the history of the church, particularly oppressed peoples, have understood that the gospel has implications in the world of, of socioeconomic life, whether it's today racial relations or in, you know, in Latin America, that's the roots of liberation theology, um, and all of these things. And Luther won't admit the implications of his theology. And when push comes to shove, he sides against the peasants and with the princes and his reputation uh, it goes into the tank in many ways. This is the, the peasant wars are in many ways the end of the popular reformation. I mentioned that on Monday and the beginning of the magisterial or the princely reformation. But this document is a wonderful window into the way that the common people, the peasants, and also the artisans uh, understood the implications of the gospel, that they should somehow spill over into the way that economic relations unfolded, into the way that social relations unfolded, or political relations, and, and the exercise of authority and power, that somehow the gospel should shape this. And Luther was much more conservative about that and was thinking primarily theologically and ecclesiastically in terms of the church as an institution. So that's the 12 articles. Um, uh, yeah, final document, the preface to the Shorter Catechism. This one is fun uh, in part just because it gives us some more very rich language out of Luther. Um, <laughs> he's not very happy, in case you can't quite see that. Um, 
uh, my God, mercy, good God, what manifold misery I beheld. So the, the background here is, remember I said the other day, if you were with us on Monday, that by the later 1520s, <coughs> when Luther started to make reforms in the churches in Wittenberg and other places in Saxony, uh, there were visitations, sort of inspections. Church, uh, church officials and government officials would go around together and inspect. And Luther was a visitor on one of these inspection tours. He was one of the ones who went around. And he was appalled at the low state of biblical literacy and theological literacy among the clergy and the ordinary people under them. And this tells us something about the process of establishing a, a Protestant church. It's one thing to say, well, we have the Reformation, but how does that unfold? Because now there's some things that change. If your argument is that it's not all about the sacraments, it's about trusting by faith in the grace of God in Christ for, for, for salvation, for atonement, for right standing with God. What that suggests then is that that will be shown in the way that you live. And for clergy, these new Lutheran clergy, they had to demonstrate by their lives that the gospel actually had the power to transform them. And this was expected of lay people as well. So the idea of a transformation of life, a process of sanctification, Luther's not so strong on sanctification as others, but it still follows out of his Reformation, uh, the idea of a transformed life. So to do that, you've got to know something. And where do you start? So this is at the very basic level. Now, there had been other manuals written in the 1520s in Wittenberg by Luther and by others to instruct people in the new teachings. But here by 15, 1529, he, he then issues a shorter and a, and a greater or a longer catechism. And this shorter one was just to be kind of the basics. And you can see in the introduction, he explains, he's writing to clergy, pastors and preachers, as to how they should use this with their lay people. And I've given you in the introduction just a sense of what follows. You can look this up. The link is there and you'll see the whole thing. But there are ongoing sections. Some of it's quite interesting, especially the, the household prayers and things like that. That the, the, next, the first thing is to talk about the Ten Commandments and teach on the Ten Commandments. Then the creed. Then the Lord's Prayer. Then baptism, confession, uh, household communion, daily prayers. And then how do we treat people in authority? They're still very big on authority. So um, these are kind of questions and answers and sort of instructions around that. So this one is, I think, a window into the practical problems of establishing a new kind of Lutheran or Protestant, if you like, uh, church in, in Luther's world. And I will say a couple of other things. There were debates about how to do this. Um, some of the reformers argued, for instance, about how much emphasis to put on the Ten Commandments. Some said, well, and, and, and how much to confess, right? How, much, how often to confess. Some said, you know, lots of emphasis on the, on the commandments and on confession um, because um, we don't want people to think that they don't need to be repentant, that they don't need to be contrite for sin. And others said, no, we want to emphasize the grace. We shouldn't speak so much about, you know, commands and, and confession. And so, you know, they had to work this out practically, how they would then teach uh, the faith. And the last thing I will say about this is at the same time as this is when you start to see also uh, from the mid to late 1520s the emergence of um, uh, Lutheran hymn writing. Both Luther himself who wrote a number of hymns and then other reformers um, and church musicians who begin to write Lutheran hymns. And actually probably 
uh, there was more instruction that happened through him singing in terms of internalizing the new theology of salvation through Christ alone and his death and resurrection and so on and so forth than through formal instruction. Him singing was really, really important as a, as a means of catechizing, of teaching um, the new faith uh, to ordinary people during the Reformation. So, um, yeah, law and gospel. Good point, Kevin. So, uh, questions, comments about this document, about any of the documents, um, any insights that you've had, just sort of whether you've read them all sort of front to back, uh, extra marks for you if you do, uh, or if you've just glanced at them a little bit, um, any comments you'd like to make or questions you'd like to ask uh, about the whole thing or any of them sort of individually. Again, either through chat or through unmuting yourself. Just give you it's a... interesting that um, Luther couldn't see the social ramifications of, of uh, his Reformation. Yeah, uh, and again, this is very broad strokes. I mean, they do, they do some things, um, like poor relief, for instance. They, uh, you know, what we would call hospitals uh, and even some schooling and so on. They do, they do take that up as part of the Reformation, and and some of the things that the the Catholic Church institutionally had done. The Protestant churches and the, and the and the states that turned Protestant took those things over. But yeah, the the what, what we would what we might call a, a critique of some of the system systemic evil or the systemic injustices uh, of the of his day. Um, uh, yeah, he didn't want to go there. He didn't want to go there. Um, yeah, nice point, Lisa. I, that's very much what I was trying to do. I think it it helps us. We can kind of see the evolving um, process here, right? The growing emphasis on um, uh, the authority of Scripture, the growing attack on papal authority, um, and, you know, from there, for instance, those two things for sure, you can sort of see an evolution of them through the documents. Um, My comment okay. has to do with, with um, today's church and in sure. particular Sunday school. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, we know the Lord's Prayer, but, but when it comes to the other documents, the emphasis falls away. Um, this is no offense to Lisa and, and uh, the quizzing program. I think it's the best program in the entire world. Yeah. All of my kids have gone through it and stuff like that. But um, there needs to be more of that, right? More scripture memorization, more tying of the word into the hearts and lives of, of our young people. Um, I'm just yeah. saying that, 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 you know, he was very, uh, Luther seems to have been very authoritative. This needs to happen. Bang, 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 bang. You need to know these things. Um, yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I think that, um, you know, the reformers all produced catechisms and catechizing was very, very important in the Reformation era. They understood that, that people just did need a knowledge base, a knowledge of their faith, whether of the scriptures or a basic theology and so on. And, uh, and I agree, Rolf, with your comment about quizzing. I think uh, uh, I've seen it over the years as a professor. The students who've come through quizzing certainly have a much deeper background in the scriptures and uh, in theology, too, for that matter. Even, I'm not, I don't teach in those areas, but still you can, you can see it. Um, but I think, I think a couple of things have happened. I think um, we... Uh, have grown in the, in, you know, I don't know, I can only speak in sort of, in, in sort of my lifetime, um, from getting lots of sort of Bible stories and basic foundational, like the Sunday school programs that those of us who are, say, over 50 grew up with, those sort of faded away, right? 
uh, it became harder or families just weren't as, as you know, got busier or whatever uh, and just couldn't or wouldn't make time for that. And so that has fallen away. And also, I think there's been a desire. I what I've seen, I'm not expert in children's ministry, but at times I've seen children's ministries focusing on giving children an experience of God. And there's some good in that for sure. I think the idea is to, to sort of give them their own living faith. But in many respects, children just have to follow along in their parents' faith for a time. And uh, the cost of that has been some of that foundational knowledge. But I think the loss of Sunday schools has been uh, very difficult to overcome. Uh, uh, um, you know, without being too melodramatic about it, I would say that any of my colleagues who've taught for, you know, two decades or more have really seen a decline overall in sort of biblical literacy. And, and I think we got comfortable as Christians because the wider culture was generally supportive of our way of life and, and of sort of Christian morality and that sort of thing. As that has uh, fallen away uh, over the last sort of since the uh, 70, 70s and 80s and onward, um, suddenly we don't have those cultural supports. And I think uh, uh, probably we're in a period now where we've got to rethink what it means to actually catechize our children uh, and new believers in the faith. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to that um, that question about about um, catechism and so on. Uh, Kevin, your point about the harsh reply to the peasants. At first, Luther wrote uh, uh, to the princes and urged them sort of moderation and so on. And then when things got going, then he wrote his, uh, you know, against the, what is it, against the murdering horde of peasants or whatever it's called. And in this, this very harsh passage about, you know, stab them in the field and, and, and basically do whatever you have to to put it down. So he, now the princes didn't need his legitima his legitimation to do that, but he did um, give them that um, sort of permission, as it were, to do that. Um, Lisa, your comment about the ninety five thesis, yeah, I mean this is a very early stage, and and insofar as he is critiquing papal authority and the sort of general problems in the church, it's, um, it's more muted. And as we move on through 15, uh, 1518, 1519, 1520, 21, in those years, we see a, 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 a growth in the criticisms, in the scale and the scope of criticisms, and the harshness as well. This Antichrist language comes in. It was in some of the documents here as well. I think in the address to the Christian nobility, he uses the Antichrist language. So the, the, the critique becomes uh, larger and harsher over the, over the few years in there. Um, Tony, very helpful. Thanks to me. Yeah. Oh, well, I wasn't in Switzerland in the 70s, so good if this is good for you. Um, quizzing, catechizing literacy. Uh, like Old Testament. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know quite what to make of that, whether whether there's not as much attention to Old Testament stories, whether we're mostly focused on New Testament texts, I'm not sure. But you definitely do need that foundation in the whole of the scripture, don't you? Um, sorry, I'm scrolling here, trying to catch up to you folks. Similarity Society now to the setting 500 years ago. Well, <laughs> where do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes and no. We live in a very different time. There was a, their, their society was sort of thoroughly sort of, you know, the church was such an important institution. It had so much power. They were in such a thoroughly Christianized society. We've sort of moved away from that. Um, our understanding, I mean, we, we don't think the same as them. They don't think the same as us. Uh, you know, we are now, you know, since the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, 
you know, science and reason and so on are so much the foundation of the ways that we think uh, today. But, you know, I think the question, the, the sort of consistency is, you know, going to the scripture and seeing, okay, what does the scripture say and how do we apply it to life? And, you know, Colleen mentioned the sort of systemic injustice piece. It's hard for me not to draw parallels to contemporary issues that, that, you know, whether everything is unfolding exactly as we would wish it is one thing, but to deny the fact that there are systemic injustices that we have just closed our eyes to and that we're being reminded of right now, you know, that's hard for me to dispute. So I think in the sense, the word of God always speaks into individual lives personally and into larger systems, larger sort of social and economic and political and legal and cultural issues. So yeah, in general terms, I think that is very much the same. So in the sense that, you know, I think there are things we can learn from Luther and the other reformers about the idea of going back to scripture and really wrestling with it and taking, you know, and not just, not just, um, you know, assuming what we think it says, but really wrestling with what it says and how to apply it. All right. Um, catechesis renewal, Jai Packer. Good. That's great. Packer on catechism. Good. Thank you. All right. We're going to wrap it up. It's 20 after nine. I've kept you uh, an hour and 10, 15 minutes here. So thanks for your time. For sure, if uh, any of you want to ask uh, other questions, uh, just get a hold of me. And I'll be happy to um, to talk about these things. Uh, that's always a good thing. So uh, I'm going to say uh, again, thank you. And uh, I wish you a good evening and come back Monday. So next week, we're going to talk about the Reformation. We're, we're leaving Luther behind. We're going to talk about uh, the city of Basel as a local example on Monday. We're going to talk uh, about Anabaptists on Wednesday. And then we'll talk about uh, Calvin and Geneva a little bit on Friday. So there's more next week. Uh, I'll try and, uh, uh, I'm not sure I got to figure out if I'm going to send out some more stuff. I give you a little bit more to read. We'll see. Uh, I'll work on that uh, in the coming days. So that's all for now. Good to see you all. Thank you. Have a Thank great you very night. Much. You bet.